Good morning everyone. Um, this is the Poverty in the UK How to Tell Stories That Inspire Change panel. Over 8.4 million people are struggling to eat in the UK and earn many earn less than a DocFest pass in a month. So we're addressing this morning the question of how to represent these realities, um, giving people dignity, agency and our responsibility to do so. Just before introducing the panel this morning, um, I wanted to share a little bit about why I'm really happy to, be, to have been asked to chair this panel. Um, I learned a lot producing A Northern Soul by Sean McAllister, which opened the festival last year and told the story of Steve, who is an aspiring rapper and a warehouse worker who was trapped in poverty despite working. Um, the film was a collaboration between the BFI, the BBC and Joseph Roundtree and taught me a lot about the question of framing and of language. And it was also interesting to see that the film had a huge, huge agency within policy circles and amongst decision makers. <coughs> it was actually brought up in Parliament three times. It underlined that we have a responsibility as filmmakers and that our films can be enablers of certain conversations and can enter spaces of policy change and reframing understanding. But it also underlined how difficult it is to make such films. Um, We'd been working on this question for many years before everything actually came together, enabling us to make it. And it, it brought up a lot of questions around working class identity and working class filmmakers. Um, there seems to be an established brand of poverty porn that dominates and is challenging, makes it challenging to tell a different story um, where there is an established narrative and to stay away from stereotypes. So this morning, the, these are some of the things that we're going to explore from different perspectives. Uh, and on the panel today, we have Danny Horan from Channel 4. We have Amina, Amina Jr., who is a contributor in Fighting Shame, which was directed by Sally Ogden. And we have Charlie Phillips, who is head of video at The Guardian, and Abigail Scott-Paul from Joseph Roundtree Foundation. Um, so to start, maybe we'll start with Abigail yep. to tell us a little bit about the framing yep. of this. So yeah, I'm from the Joseph Roundtree Foundation over in York, and we're an organisation that is set up to try and solve poverty in the UK. And in order to do so, we have realised that really how the public think about poverty in this country, uh, public attitudes and the representation of people in poverty are a real barrier to getting the change that we want to see at a policy level and also at a practical level. So we are really keen to work with storytellers to try and open up minds uh, in the, you know, the public's mind to the uh, opportunity there is to solve poverty in this country and reach new audiences. So we want to, you know, not just preach to the converted, we want to appeal to audiences beyond the core base of uh, allies who are already warm to the issue. And we have done um, a significant piece of research looking at how audiences think about poverty in this country. And what it has shown is that the way we tell stories is really, really important in terms of how those stories are heard and understood. So what I'd briefly like to do is just chat through some of this, uh, these findings and highlight some challenges, but also some opportunities for filmmakers. So if you're wanting to tell stories about communities and the grip of poverty, then there's some things that you should be aware about and uh, it will help you make strategic choices about the language you use or the visuals you use. So I've got a few examples, so I'll just quickly run through those if that's okay. So first of all, from the research we've, uh, with 20,000 people across the UK, we know that there are some severe uh, issues in terms of um, engaging audiences because they have these, sh uh, we're calling them mental shortcuts. So they default to thinking, people default to thinking uh, these things, that there's not really poverty in this country, it's po poverty really exists in Africa or India. Um, the idea of self-makingness, that actually if you just try harder, you will get out of poverty. That is a narrative that is really, really entrenched in people's minds. There's also a sense that actually poverty is not really, is it just about like not having a roof over your head? So the idea of sort of destitution, the idea of, you know, the concept of relative poverty is, is not really well understood. 
Um, across all uh, sections of the British public, there's a real, real fatalism, a bit like in climate change, that there's no sense that change is possible. There's a kind of idea that, oh, well, the system's rigged, they'll always be rich, always be poor people, and that's just the way it is. So that is a real barrier, getting people to see solutions. And finally, um, presentations of poverty that are kind of really using politicised language really turn off those audiences that are not really warm to the issue, so it can be a barrier. I mean, poverty is a political issue, but using highly politicised language um, can really turn off audiences you're trying to engage. Um, and in terms of what impact this way, these ways of thinking have, we've seen it quite recently. So Emma Thompson came out uh, for the Food Foundation talking about Dickensian levels of poverty in this country, and you'll see it a lot in the papers. And uh, this led to a reaction in the Daily Mail, you know, like really just denying the existence of poverty in the UK because she's evoking that sense of, you know, a time before in Dickensian times where people didn't have shoes or what have you. And that just leaves people who are not warm to the issue to instantly discount your argument. And similarly, um, the comic relief stories this year, I mean, um, Lenny Henry directly compared poverty in Africa to poverty in the UK, and that again evoked this like really uh, dangerous <laughs> reaction in the Daily Mail that, where you know, Tory politicians were flat out denying the picture of poverty he painted, even though like, he was talking about the rising use of food banks. So um, the language we use and the way we tell the story is really, really important in terms of how audiences understand that story. So uh, I wanted to quickly touch on um, some recommendations that we are willing to, to work with you in this room to be able to tell these stories in a way that can lead to greater engagement with the content. And one of the first recommendations is really widening the lens of the story. So this idea of self-makingness, it's down to your own grit and determination to get out of poverty. To counter that, we need to bring context around people's lives into the story. And uh, I saw Sean uh, wrote something where he described a Northern Soul as a single, a single character narrative that attempts to investigate the bigger political issues within an individual character. So I know character is king, but we need to bring in the wider context in which people are living so that the audience can see it's not about fixing individuals, it's about fixing the systems and structures that are trapping people or restricting people's opportunities. And could I just play the trailer for this? So anyway, A Northern Soul is a brilliant example of how, um, you know, it's, a, it's really focused on the story of Steve, but you see how debt, low pay, insecure work is really kind of restricting the opportunities he has and, you know, kind of how he's working hard to unlock opportunities for others in his community. So, um, you know, really think about how you can bring context in as a character, but in a really engaging way. Um, Another recommendation is around telling stories with hope. So this is with the purpose of actually um, countering the fatalism that's really um, sort of beset <laughs> in our society. And we are really living in a depressed uh, public, you know, the public are really depressed about Brexit and other things. And actually, um, we need to demonstrate that change is possible. And there are, there are, there are communities who are working in really difficult circumstances, who are finding solutions themselves. So really being able to talk about solutions in your presentations is really, really important. And um, I'd like to show the trailer for The Mighty Red Car, which was a BBC Two documentary series. So yeah, I mean, the, the music, the tone, uh, the use of the language we're talking about, this is our town, it's people from the town narrating it, really gives a sense of agency in that community, and it's a community that's often uh, you know, stigmatised in, in the press for being a really deprived and hopeless place. And I think this, you know, telling stories of hope can engage audiences that are maybe you know, quite far away um, from, from the lives of people that are featured in it. Um, one of the other recommendations is really telling stories to bring in audiences that are not as close to poverty or don't have experience of communities is to really demonstrate how these stories relate, uh, are of concern to all of us and relate, you know, there's a common thread there that is relatable, the humanity of um, kind of the issues being explored, how it's in all our interests to care about this. And I want to show this quick advert uh, for the Homeless World Cup, which is taking place in Wales in July.
So I love that really we're all the same and this is what you know kind of the representation you know sometimes it works to actually other people to you know the representation is like it's a group of people over there that don't really relate to us watching it and actually what we need to do is tell stories where those common threads are kind of um, that show that we're all like each other and we all depend on kind of uh, each other to uh, have a uh, live a better life I suppose so the visuals I love that you know you see there's a nod to the sort of landscape there you know you're standing in front of the, the steelworks but it's on a football pitch and and I, I just think think about like how you're presenting people and, and the background I think that's really really important in terms of how audiences see uh, see the image um, another recommendation oops sorry um, is around or oh, there's some is, is really trying to invoke values because values are really important in demonstrating why something matters. And often in po poverty campaigns, people talk about fairness, and that's a value that can actually not work for certain audiences. So actually, it's about what is right in our society. And we, we're seeing in our communication as an organisation, we're starting to um, use values to talk about poverty, and it really helps people understand why this issue matters. So uh, we see there a, a, a kind of headline from the Times talking about the burning injustice of uh, people who are trapped in poverty and asking that question, is this the re really the society we want? So again, it's about that collective responsibility. So think about how, how can a presentation really invoke that sense? And I think that's what Northern Soul did really well. You really got a sense of, the, you know, it was just not right that Steve was working all these hours and still massively in debt and not being able to build a better life. Um, metaphor is really, really important. So uh, the research we did uh, tested a load of metaphors because basically they allow an audience to sort of for a story to stick and see what, some, what a message means. And the two metaphors that were proven to improve understanding and pr improve support for change around the idea of currents, there being currents around us that are pulling us into poverty, and also this idea of restricting and restraining, so we might articulate that as people trapped in poverty, people in the grip of poverty, people locked in, in poverty. But what they're doing is seeing the context around people's lives, so you're able to point to, to, to you know, low pay or debt trapping people. So you're left, with the audience is left understanding that it's actually the low pay that we need to fix, not the individual themselves. So thinking about how that might be articulated in a treatment, I think would be great. Um, in A Northern Soul, actually, there's a scene where Steve talks about being cornered and that's his articulation of, that, of those metaphors. So that is really, really uh, a useful tool to use. And we're seeing it cut through and rippling out into the media discourse in the uh, print media that the metaphors we are using and putting out in our sort of press releases are being like picked up out by the sub-editors and used in headlines. So you see those in action there. Finally, um, we'll talk about stats. Um, everybody loves shoving stats in documentaries, but just be really aware that you have to create a narrative around those stats, really spell out and explain what those stats mean. Because saying just 3.7 million children in poverty, people who are not like really close to the issue, they don't really understand, is that a large figure or not? So um, just being really uh, clever, and you'll see like the difference there, just talking about more and more children are becoming homeless, that's enough to get the message landed. Uh, and in Michael Sheen's video, he talks about more and more people experiencing homelessness. He's not talking about millions or percentages there. Mm -hmm. And then finally, I just wanted to end on, on the importance of working really with people in a meaningful way. And it's about building trust and relationships, and that does take time. Uh, and I think, um, you know, the people we work with, you know, they, they have um, experienced, you know, you know, not great, they've not had great experiences of working with storytellers and media. You know, people who come into their communities and go out again. And really, um, it's, uh, I can't underestimate the importance of that, and maybe it's something that Amina might talk about in a bit. But finally, just to say, we're here, JRF, if your stories are touching on social issues, on, you know, like the kind of stories of behind Brexit, then do come and talk to us, because we've got this insight that hopefully will create amazing content that will attract new audiences to your stories. Thank you. I think this would be a great point to bring in Sally to tell us a little bit about fighting shame, which um, represents a lot of what Abigail's been talking about. Yeah, definitely. Oh, sorry, I've got a virus. But um, if, um, we pitched last year, I worked for True Vision Yorkshire, I'm based in Leeds, and we pitched for the GRF uh, Guardian pitch last year at Sheffield, and um, we wanted to do that. Um, well, I'm actually from um, 
uh, background that you know I've experienced a lot of poverty myself I come from that community and it's really hard for me to watch things that are not done well that don't represent people that I know really well and, and um, I find it really damaging and I'm just crossing over from producer to um, director anyway and um, so I've gone on a journey myself about what kind of filmmaker do I want to be um, and I, I really care about this subject and I want to represent it well and I don't want to ever make a film that I'm ashamed of, that, I'm, that my contributors are ashamed of or that I can't put out there and, and be really proud of. Um, so that's why um, I wanted to pitch in actually and I really care about reframing this subject in the media and actually saying that it's not people's fault that they're in poverty and that's a really clear message but one that we just don't hear um, and so that's why we pitched in and it's brilliant that um, we got through and we've been really supported by Jeref and Guardian and we're really grateful to them and you know we decided to do a participation model which meant that we, from the beginning, uh, we started to work with um, Poverty Truth Commission in Leeds and um, found people that might want to work with us and we found this amazing group of women, two of them are sat here, mum and daughter today, who, who actually have had bad experiences of the media themselves but decided to trust us and True Vision have got an amazing background of, of working with contributors and have made some amazing films on poverty anyway and we make difficult issue based subjects a lot um, all the time for Channel 4 and BBC anyway so we've got a uh, track record uh, um, yeah we went on this journey together and they, they came to Sheffield last year and pitched in we all pitched there was about eight of us um, and it was a brilliant experience and so we're really proud actually it's showing tonight at six o'clock um, in the exchange um, and, and we're going to do a Q&A afterwards with all the ladies in the film. Um, so I just think, you know, it's been a brilliant experience for all of us. We had a debrief a few weeks ago um, and, you know, the things that were coming back, actually some of the things that um, some of the people that have taken part were saying is I don't have to live in shame anymore and I don't have to live behind closed doors anymore. And, you know, like to take us, to take, um, a subject like shame and it's a feeling actually what we decided to have production meetings right from the beginning with our women and that's not something we normally do that's not the model that we normally take obviously we work closely and respectfully with with the people in our films but we don't have loads and loads of production meetings because that's really timely and costly but it was really important that we did that and we really really listened to our contributors from the beginning and also that we didn't tell stories we didn't do something to them but we enabled and empowered them to tell their own stories that was the difference actually um, and we gave them loads of editorial control which um, is not quite normally how we do it and sometimes <laughs> makes commissioners nervous um, but we handed loads and loads of control over and and just worked with them to shape the film um, and um, you know obviously showed them it as it was in the edit and you know just checked that they were happy with everything and um, you know just made sure that when it went out that they could be really proud of it um, so should we show a clip of Amina um, and I think it, it was really important to show some solutions and, and you know I come from a community where people are doing things all day long to help their community quietly and graciously and amazingly and I'm sure that there's lots of people in this room that know those heroes, everyday heroes as well and it was really important that we got some of that across and we've got Mary in our film doing incredible things, feeding her community as well and, and um, I mean has done something amazing with Education Aid in terms of recycling school uniforms and so you know that was part of telling these stories that they needed to have that that really uplifting feel to them as well and we're not shying away from difficult issues and the the problem in terms of um, a television company that we have and pitching into Danny all the time is that you know poverty is a hard sell and it's not entertainment and it can't be entertainment you know we've got starving children in our film and that's just not funny on in any shape or form and you know so it's trying to work out how to tell these stories um, in a really dignified 
warm way and we need humour in our films that but they rate well and, and they've got you know they tick all the boxes for the channel and so that's our challenge and that's you know where we're up to with it all but it was brilliant to to actually um experiment um just not for broadcast and, and guardian have given us that platform and we're really grateful to them for that so just before we talk about poverty as a hard sell would it would be great to hear from you amina and it's it's great to have you here can you tell us a bit about what made the collaboration with Sally and True Vision so successful for you? Yeah, um, the fact that when we first met with True Vision, they only wanted the truth from us and they was um, adamant really that how we want the film to be is how they will make the film for us. And every step of the way, we've had conversa conversation between both partners and it's been working really well, yeah. Are there any recommendations you would give to people who are looking into subjects like this? Um, I think for people that want to work in a similar way, I think the best thing to do is come direct and don't have a middleman. Just be patient with the people as well as it takes a long time for someone to open up and be comfortable and to speak about such raw emotion and that making them feel more human and that they do matter and <clears throat> take them into consideration really. You mentioned that you'd had some previous bad experiences I guess, are there specific things like afterwards, after the programme has been on or as the programme is being filmed? that you could talk about a bit more? Yeah, um, after the documentary was launched, we had a few negative comments online. So what I would say is to um, prioritise aftercare and to show them that these little minor things don't really matter and that it's the bigger picture that counts and they do need protection because at the end of the day, we tell our story and we have to go home with that story, whereas other people don't. And it does keep us up at night sometimes and these emotions just don't go away once we've opened this big book. Thank you. Did you want to speak a little bit about the commissioning process, both of you? Yeah, should I just say something? And the to follow from there. So yeah, so we, um, this is the second year that we've done our collaboration with JRF, um, and it's been a really important thing for us, uh, both as an organisation that wants to be telling stories of poverty, it always has, and obviously The Guardian's got a strong heritage in talking about these things, but also in admitting that we don't always get it right as an organisation, um, not just in our uh, films, but in, our, in the written word, and there's a lot to be learned from Abigail and everyone at JRF, but also contributors like Amina and filmmakers like Sally, um, to help us frame how we do things and always be learning. Um, last year, um, as well as Fighting Shame, the other film that came out was a film called, uh, from the pitch, um, was a film called Now But A Fleeting Thing that's about rural poverty. Um, it's just been finished and um, we're gonna try and get it into a couple of festivals. And I think that's also really interesting um, as, a, as a, a totally different aspect of poverty that maybe we don't know enough about in The Guardian because I think people often, when they think about poverty, they think about Leeds and they think about London, they think about big cities, but there's this whole other world going on. Um, and so it was great to get those two films out of it that sort of represent these two different aspects of, of poverty. Um, I think the thing I'd sort of say from our perspective, commissioning work at The Guardian, um, it's, one of the really fundamental things for me, and it's always been like this since I started commissioning at The Guardian, is that we do stories where you're hearing directly from contributors and that the films feel participatory. So it's why a lot of our films are observational and use a very minimal amount of um, voiceover from um, journalists and reporters, because we just want to try and have this, uh, like this removal of the middleman and try and have this unmediated experience because um, I think it's really really important that people hear those voices directly and it's also why the kind of people we commission to make our documentaries 
are ideally people who are embedded in communities who are going to spend a lot of time in communities and really convince us that they have the meaningful access um, and it's kind of is why a lot of our documentaries are commissioned from outside of the building rather than made in house because we want people to come to us and say that they've spent a really long time um, winning like winning trust and participating um, in a way that possibly some of our in-house people might not be able to um, having said that um, I also wanted to give a shout out to John Domakos, who's sitting in the audience back there, who, um, just to embarrass you, um, um, he did a series for us called Made in Stoke and also does Anywhere at Westminster. And I think he's a really good example of um, someone who is in, is in the organisation but spends the, a significant amount of time actually going to communities, talking to people, actually spending the time waiting for stories to um, to emerge and this thing about aftercare is really important as well not just kind of extracting and, and running away but thinking about how you can keep going back to those stories how you can let stories develop and maybe not release them until the like the moment that's going to have the biggest impact on, on communities and the perspective from channel four um i mean I, i'll answer your question because it's quite a good question about is poverty a hard sell and I think it, um, I mean, I think for us, of course, we're looking at stories of poverty. It's one of the biggest issues in Britain today. So we want to commission stories and authentic stories mm -hmm. around it. Um, and there's various things that we've got coming up and various things we've done. I agree with Charlie. Some of, some of the stuff we've not got exactly right. Um, in my personal view, I've only been at the channel for 10 months, but... Previous to that, I was at the BBC. I commissioned the Mighty Red Car. I commissioned Generation Gifted, which and those are programmes. I think that speak to the thing that you talk of, which is hope. Which I think I agree with you is the is one of the biggest things we should latch onto, because also I think hope attracts audience, right? So that's the thing that is one of the most critical things for us, and the hardest thing for us, um, as opposed to quite a lot of the platforms or publishers is we, need, we do, we have to get wider audiences for all sorts of reasons, but not least because you want to get the message across to as many people as possible for them to understand the issues. Um, so I think we, you know, like I say, I, I'm not, I don't, I'm not uh, I don't think we've got loads of it right in the past, but I think moving forward, there's a lot of stuff coming down the line that is, speaks to that. I love the idea that you're into a sort of getting more unmediated storytelling and I think that's, we're, and I personally think we're entering an era a bit more of that about how we can get this sort of authentic portrayal. And I don't, and not just in poverty, but all sorts of things, uh, issues, race, um, uh, you know, gender, um, sexuality. I think it's a sort of, those are the subjects that we should be looking at in that sort of, in, in that space too. You mentioned something about um, who you want to work with ideally and within Fighting Shame there's this quote at the end of nothing about us without us and I... Yeah, could we show the clip? We've got that clip as well. Okay, so. should we show this clip? I don't think we have to. Yeah, I, well I just wanted to springboard off that, that quote which yeah. is used quite a lot. In, in this question of who's telling stories and who has the agency to tell stories. And I wondered what you each thought about it within the context of filmmaking and who's telling the stories. And should it be that people are telling, are embedded in telling their own stories? Or should we be expecting of all filmmakers to, to be telling nuanced stories and layered stories and spending the time to understand what they're telling a story about and being responsible for it? I mean, I personally think you need a range. I mean, I think that's the, that's the best thing. It's like to have incredibly opinionated, authored filmmakers making films with strong points of view, I think is totally, we should be really on for because some people are incredibly, some filmmakers are incredibly insightful and offer a different point of view that you are, you're really struck by and that can change your perception hugely. So I think we should embrace that. That's one thing. We should definitely embrace the unmediated, which is the Author, the authentic filmmakers who are right embedded, it's their story, they own it completely. So, and then I think there are also programs where the teams of people working on things to help tell stories, and stories like poverty, by uh, the subject of poverty, is embedded in lots of different programs. So it's embedded in things like 24 Hours in A&E, or First Dates, or you know, 24 Hours in Police Custody, or you know, um, 
or ambulance on BBC. I, ju I think those are, we ha it has to be done sort of everywhere in a way for it to be absorbed in a sort of more truthful way. And that's why it should also be in things like Hollyoaks and East End. I mean, it is, and that's, mm -hmm. so to be getting it everywhere in, in as authentic way as possible, I think is, is the key. I don't think you can go just one, one direction on it. That's my view. And I think it's not just about the filmmaker, because I agree with Danny, it's definitely you need a range, and I think anyone can tell any story. Um, I, but I think it's about the language you use often, and like Abigail says, the images. And so for us, actually, as a company working with JRF, has been so incredibly useful, and we're going on to make some more films um, about poverty um, in an institution. And so we've contacted another agency through Abigail's advice that we would have never done before, if I'm honest. We would a thought to well maybe we need to look actually around social policy on this issue and make sure we really represent this right or don't mis misrepresent it in any way because it actually is so easy to get it wrong because it's a lot of it is so subtle sometimes yeah maybe we you can talk a little bit about what it is that you can actually offer to filmmakers in a sense because in reality you're the person telling the story making the film and what you're doing is is framing or, yeah. or kind of feeding into the framing and the language so i definitely there's a craft of storytelling right and um you know we think that the best stories are when are when there's like true collaboration between those telling the stories and the person whose story they're telling and i, I do think there's a mix of approaches that are, are kind of useful but the people you know people have to be in the room and, and have to feel like they have a sense of agency over the way that story is told and what we can do is we can um, kind of, uh, you know, provide tools and insight on how stories, um, you know, kind of be more effective at reaching new audiences on the type of language, you know, the, the, the challenges of particular types of language. You know, we saw that, like, you know, talking about Dickensian levels of poverty is not helpful if you want to bring a wider audience in on the issue of poverty. But um, I think it's, um, it is, and also we can provide, you know, kind of, uh, we work with a lot of organisations on the ground and we work with um, kind of um, people like On Road Media who are really good. I know you, t you warned about intermediaries, but I think they're a great broker between, they, they understand what the media and storytellers want and need, but also have a really good understanding of the people they're working with and kind of act as that kind of bridge, I guess. And we facilitate interactions. Uh, you know, we've been to, you know, BBC uh, in Salford, uh, you know, went down to Newsnight, uh, they went to EastEnders, you know, script writers at EastEnders. And it's about building that relationship so we can offer that type of interaction. Um, so, but the question, it comes back to that point of collaboration, you know, kind of it's doing it in a really kind of um, participatory and uh, kind of a less hierarchical way, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, definitely. And I think it's not always easy when you're working with completely different platforms so you know yeah. for us for example it was working with a film organization a tv broadcaster and a foundation which technically actually can never even on the financing work together in one way so there's a lot of kind of mixing and matching and trying to work out how you can make it work should we talk a little bit about audiences which seems to be the kind of key you know as as broadcasters or commissioners you're thinking about numbers and audiences and and who is this kind of audience that we're trying to attract into this space and how do we speak to them? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think if speaking just for us in particular, I think we're quite, maybe we're a sort of unusual organisation in that we have such a large global progressive audience and that's a really good thing because in the sense of kind of, you know, getting to, getting to people who care and getting to do-gooders and progressives, we can definitely get them. Even though, as Abigail was saying, some of those people are responsible for some of the like, unhelpful rhetoric around poverty. I think in terms of getting to that um, wider audience and getting outside of the <coughs> choir, um, because, the, because the majority of our views come directly on YouTube for our films, there's a sort of natural widening of our, of our normal base that happens on there. Um, but YouTube is kind of the Wild West and you can't always control where that message is going out. You can't always control how people are going to be receiving it and how they're going to comment about it. Um, and it's, it can be frustrating that you don't necessarily have control over who's going to be 
receiving the work. But I think that's why it's so important to be responsible in the stories that you're telling so that you don't open yourself up to any avenues of people misunderstanding or getting the wrong message. But I think in terms of the question of like who are we trying to reach, um, you really, I think it's really important with these kind of stories that they are reaching the widest base possible. And that's, that's um, I suppose that's why with, I suppose that's why broadcast is so important for a lot of these stories and why doing it responsibly, which I absolutely think Danny does and the, and the work he does is so, is so important. I think um, the, clearly we, you know, I work at a commercial channel, so we've got, you know, we need to, to get the widest audience possible, but also clearly these stories deserve to get the widest audience possible. And how we do that sometimes is, you know, we're, we're trying to get an audience that is going to be educated in some way about it. And my fear is, and the thing that keeps me up at night slightly, is that we're often making these films and we're just telling the people that already feel that about the subject. Mm -hmm. So we're just reaffirming their view on it. So no offence to The Guardian, but I'm not interested in trying to get Guardian sort of readers to watch this kind of programmes on Channel 4. I'm trying to get the Daily Mail to Elder Sun readers to mm -hmm. get in to watch or The Telegraph rather than The Guardian because they're more likely to have empathy for the people in these situations than... The de I'm, I'm speaking completely generally here, right? But... Um, but um, and stereotyping. But that's the truth. And those are the conversations we have. So how do you get that audience the widest audience possible to get them to talk about the subject, to engage in the subject. And then like you as well, we try and do screenings in Parliament to get the change going. I mean, you know, the title for this session is what, you know, uh, stories that inspire change. I mean, what does that mean? What do we all mean by that? I mean, do you mean you want to in change policy? Do we mean we want to have grassroots change that people just engage in the subject more and have more time for one another, or engage in community projects? Do we want to engage tabloid media to sort of create much bigger stories that create pressure on polit politicians? I mean, I think, I mean, for me, the answer is sort of all of that stuff, but, um, mm. but it's none of it's easy because my worry is it's just the same people are just watching the same stuff mm. and we're not getting, we're not challenging our audience enough, which is the thing that I'm desperate to do at Channel 4 and I think the thing that we try and do as much as possible. And that's often uncomfortable sometimes the, 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 the end product is slightly uncomfortable with people with a slightly more liberal viewpoint because they feel we're doing the wrong thing by the representation. However, sometimes I would argue we're trying to get a different audience, we're trying to get them to engage in the subject and challenge your view on things. Like I say, we don't always get it right, but um, that's the goal. Yeah, and I think, I think there's a challenge there for how can we create content that are not specific issue-based documentaries where actually it's actually content or stories where these seeds are kind of in there but you're not the audience is not going to watch a documentary mm. about poverty and I, I think that's where the challenge comes um, and that's hopefully why we're here is to like put this challenge to people who make this stuff how can we engage wider audiences in sort of the issues that are facing Britain today but not in a kind of you know, not necessarily in a boring, didactic way, but in a fun, engaging humour, like the Mighty Red Car way, yeah. um, that uh, is surprising. Or a, for, or a format, like we tried to, do, yeah, the BBC, I commissioned for BBC One, you know, the week the landlords moved in, and that was, mm. that was about housing issue. I mean, yeah. it, it's an entertaining way into housing issue, but, it, it, housing issue, but, it, but it, that's what it was about. Mm -hmm. But trying to get a broader audience to this stuff to, to engage it. Yeah. It's bloody difficult, though. I mean, that's, that's the <laughs> truth, I mean. Yeah. And, yeah, and, it's a, and it's a challenge for everyone. It's not mm. just for Channel 4 to do it. It's not just for The Guardian to do it. I think everyone needs to do it collectively be because we've all got quite different audiences. And I think thinking about the Daily Mail audience is really important. So we've done research on public attitudes to uh, poverty and, and, and trying to seg segment the public into different groups. And across all groups, BBC and Daily Mail come top in terms of how they consume media. So while we might scoff at those headlines, they're really, really important because people buy the Daily Mail and it reinforces those ways of thinking across mass audiences. So we have to take on that challenge. Um, and I think there are ways into stories, you know, the Daily Mail does care about pensioners and, you know, people, you know, we're seeing rising levels of pensioner poverty after, you know, two decades of a of specific policy to reduce pensioner poverty. But, you know, that is a challenge for us, like, where, where are the ways in to tell that story to, a, you know, a Daily Mail audience? I think we should have in the back of our mind. 
Yeah, and the you know what to pitch, Abigail. <laughs> <laughs> also, I think I mean with, with the Daily Mail specifically, I think the Daily Mail is actually a real follower of trends. Like I, I don't really believe in the idea that the Daily Mail like puts these diktats out and all these stupid people across the country read it and believe it. They'll um, they'll follow the line of what the country. Uh, attitude generally in the country so if we're putting out these messages that are more positive and are inspiring change then I honestly think the mail will fall into line eventually so it's not just about it's not just about demonizing them that's very optimistic of each other <laughs> <laughs> so, well yeah, done you've got to be optimistic okay on this note of optimism maybe we'll open to see if there are any questions we've got about half an hour and if there are any questions put your hand up and wait for the mic there's one just here. Hi. Um, very, very interesting discussion. Um, thanks, all of you. Um, so I run a company um, which deals with criminal uh, justice, making programs about crime and the criminal justice system. And we're a combination of uh, ex-offenders and filmmakers. Um, and one of the things that we've found in our group um, of people is that we've got Jeremy Corbyn supporters and we've got Tony, Tommy Robinson supporters. Um, so, and that's one of the things about true diversity. So I'm wondering if you had that issue with... Um, the uh, shame film, and how you uh, how you found that experience. Um, well, I mean, we didn't get into politics. <laughs> we didn't discuss that in, on that level. Um, um, we had people of different faiths as well, and I think you know, we, you know, it's really important to sometimes keep things like that out of it for us personally because we had. We, we, we really needed to work together as a team and we already were obviously trying to communicate a really important message around um, how um, everyone felt um, emotionally and then put that into image and language. So um, for us, um, we didn't have that, but we had loads of disagreements, you know, like Amina's laughing here <laughs> because it's true. <laughs> And, um, you know, when you're making sensitive films, you will always have that and you're always navigating difficult territory. There's so much diplomacy and all that <coughs> stuff. And you have to have really honest and frank conversations and nothing has to be hidden. Because you, if you've got contributors going away resentful and they're not talking to you and they're talking to other people, you've, you're definitely at risk of losing them. And so we never work like that. We're really straight up with, with everybody. And so we've had some really frank conversations over the time of making our film and lots of films that we make for True Vision. But, you know, we, we just really come together and talk and, and um, work, work together, really. And, and just it's fine to disagree. It's really OK. And it's really OK to have different opinions. And, and that's really healthy, isn't it? It's really important. Um, but we definitely stay away from politics in, on that level, you know, in it's terms all, of political parties. Politics. Isn't it all politics? Because um, <laughs> left and right are identifying the same problem. Mm -hmm. And you're dealing with facts here. And I think it's fantastic, the facts with the Roundtree Foundation that you're putting out there. But left and right are both. Yeah, and I think in, with poverty, we're up against this dominant narrative. Like on the left, people say it's all structure systems. On the right, it's bad behavior, poor life choices. And actually, it's a common, you know, like we, we want to sort of stop having that conversation. And that's why things like trying to use values and those unarguable <coughs> truths is a way to have that conversation that breaks down um, through those political discussions. And that's why one of the recommendations is tone down the politi you know, politicised language and how we talk. And I don't know if you've, you've seen the fallout of the UN Special Rapporteur who did this like huge political rant but actually just led to the government completely denying and it wasn't engaging with the issue. So I think thinking about like the values and criminal justice is a really tough issue. Um, they've done some reframing work, so I can point you to the direction of what their recommendations are. But um, we, yeah, we using and, and demonstrating the common, the, where there is commonality, I think might help. Like what, and also being clear about what the purpose of the film is. Like what, what, what is it? And is that something that everybody, all the contributors can get behind? So that everyone has a clear focus of what, because I think it was a really clear purpose, this yeah. film, mm -hmm. what we wanted to do with it. And that just being, so everybody is on board with it. 
Great question. I mean, just with my producer hat, it, does, it seems to be really rare at the moment there are subjects that very disparate groups agree on, and it's something that film can actually cut across and, and do, and that's an amazing thing um, and something to really embrace. And I yeah, think I, mean, I think Grace and Perry's that. series on Brexit was a brilliant example mm. of how he brought two groups in. It. Mm. He basically demonstrated everybody's the same, <laughs> no matter mm. what they voted, but in a really clever way. Because yeah, pe people aren't mm. that simple. Like, no one yeah. is just a Corbyn supporter yeah. or just a Tommy Robinson supporter. People move all the time. Yeah. Any other questions? If you put your hands straight up. Can you wait for the microphone? So, um, from what I'm gathering at the moment, would you say, because we're, I'm doing, I'm, I'm into uh, criminal justice at the moment, same as this man here, working with ex-offenders, um, um, and we have an organisation, and I work with ex-offenders as well, and I come from a very diverse place called Brixton, so you can imagine all the different things that's going on in, in Brixton. So but one of the ethoses that we are trying to underpin is the thing called common ground. We think it's so important. So would you say that the, to make the, the documentary is to try and keep that common ground all the way through so that we have an even argument or an even debate of what's going on around us? So the work I've done on how public think about these issues, I definitely think so. I, I think the issue you'll have is it's really easy for the audience to blame those individuals in, in, in prison for their, for their poor choices. So really bringing in a sense of like the wider context in which they've made their choices. Akala's book, I don't know if you've read Natives, but he has a really good quote where he says, you know, personal responsibility exists in a context. So really tell that context, find a way of telling that context over and over again, because people already have really front of mind choice and resp personal responsibility. So you don't need to remind them of that. You need to remind them more and more about the context. So finding a way of doing that, I think, could be helpful. Any other responses? No? Any other questions? Oh, there's another one just there. Thank you. Um, Sally and Charlie and Danny, I wondered if you could talk a bit more about this idea of handing over editorial control a bit, because I think giving contributors the kind of control is key, but how do you negotiate that and where do you draw the line? And how did it work with you guys? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's probably, I, I assume you have, you're coming under Ofcom guidelines as well. Do you uh, no, no, we're not, we're not covered oh, by okay, Ofcom, okay. We're, we're covered under um, press guidelines. Okay, okay, so we have quite, I mean, we have quite a tight, um, guidelines around this that editorial control in the end rests with the channel it's the same with the BBC and ITV channel 5 so it rests with us now that sounds more sort of draconian than it really is because what we really want uh, and actually wanted to address this as well about the sort of relationship between contributor and directors that is the key relationship out of everything so this and that's about trust so it, you, the contributors have to trust the filmmaker the filmmakers have to trust the contributors that they're being honest and truthful we have to trust the filmmaker and the production company it's all based around trust really so it's sort of a lot of it's very very unwritten now in the end yes the editorial control asks us but we this it's unbelievably rare you get into a situation where we broadcast something that goes against the will of the contributor or the institutions. Sometimes that happens, but um, there will be various complicated reasons for why that would why would that happen. But really, what you're relying on, and having I came up through the directing route, is that you're relying on your um, relationship on the ground. If there's a problem, there's an issue, you try and resolve it there and then, or whatever that may be. So it never escalates to a point of you get to a viewing and it's like this wasn't what I, I expected. I don't want that scene to be in here now. It sh you shouldn't really be at that. It shouldn't really be at that stage. So, so for me, it's all about trust. Yeah, I mean, it's the same with. Our, I mean, you can say how it was from your perspective, um, but we. It's the same thing, really. In contractually, we have final editorial say, but it's not something that we kind of wield, you know, as a big stick or anything. It's totally. It's always a compromise. I don't think in my time we've ever imposed anything on anyone that they didn't want to do, and especially for this kind of film, it is, a, it is a collaboration. I think it's about managing expectations as well, right from the beginning, that's really important with contributors, and so then you're not setting them up to think that they have 
complete editorial control because obviously we've just said that's not possible and um, you know this is slightly different because yes it wasn't for one of the main broadcasters and it was under this remit so it was that I guess that's what I'm saying it was slightly different to anything we've ever done because we did hand over much more editorial control than we normally would um, but we still had to be really responsible for shaping the narrative of the films and you know we never expected um, you know we were a production team but and we kept bringing that to the table um, but we you know we were always responsible for that and we kept um, you know saying yeah but we kind of need to make sure that um, you know, we've got the narrative really running clear and what, what is, does that look like? You know, you can talk a lot about things when you're making films, but it of, often comes down to scenes and, and how you tell that story and what that looks like. And so, I, I, you know, I think some of the editorial control on this occasion was, was around uh, language, actually. We had a lot of discussion around language and just how it was so important. So this idea of this term, direct experience of poverty, uh, well, or lived, exp sorry, lived experience of poverty, um, I guess that's a really popular term at the moment, but the ladies in our film didn't like that and they're, they're not keen on that and they were really insistent that that came out as a line in the film. Um, and we talked about that a lot, and, and that was taken out, actually. Um, and I met somebody recently who now says direct experience of poverty, which is what I've started saying. Because, um, you know, I think that's, that does seem to sound better. Charlie would say people on lower incomes or what have you. But, you know, for us, actually, a lot of that process um, ended up being about language, interestingly. Amina, well, did you, you want to add anything about that editorial experience and feeding back on, on what you were seeing? Um, I found that it, it was quite interesting because whenever we didn't agree on something we would just mention it to Sally or somebody else and then obviously would have the conversation and most of the time if we didn't like something they would just take it out or we'd reshoot it and it was really nice to know that we could trust them like that to actually um, show us how we actually are and not how they want us to be. I was just going to say that, you know, it is, again, it, you're talking about trust as well, and it's, and it's true, I think that it does come down to that, and, but the truth is, is that there is the unwritten contract is that Sally is making editorial decisions all the time, you know, it's not completely unmediated, I mean, I know you were obviously in conversations all the time about what you put in, but you're in the edit, you are making editorial decisions, it is your voice yeah. and opinion, which is, I, I, which is a great thing, I think, as well, because I think, you know, we live in an age of, like, people can shoot their own stuff and do, and it's everywhere, so in a way, you know, you're going, you're approaching something like watching um, Sally's film on The Guardian, you're watching it knowing that somebody is behind making that, so it's also about your own context with what you're going to watch as well, isn't it? And I think on stories about poverty, often what is left unsaid is quite important as well. And uh, we had quite, a, I was at Children in Need last week talking to content creators there. And there was a, a documentary maker, we talked about, and we had a bit of an issue around a scene where there was a, a long pan across a flat screen TV in, in the film. And I just said, look, if, um, if, you, if we show this in this way, the audience is automatically going to default to that mental shortcut that, well, you know, if they can afford a flat screen TV, they can't really be in poverty. And that's not really the conversation we want. So in the edit suite, I think you guys are making decisions all the time about what's in, what's out. Just being aware of how certain, you know, representations could provoke a reaction like that in the audience's mind, I think, it, you know, and then it's up to you whether you include it or not. Or, but trying to explain away why somebody has a flat screen TV is not really going to change that an audience who's sceptical on the fact that, well, really, they've all got mobile phones, flat screen TVs, not really in poverty. So just being aware of that. Well, we had that problem, actually, with the Mac laptop and the mirrors. Um, um, so I went to university and I got an Apple Mac computer. I left university, I still had the computer. And it was in the documentary and all the comments were, well, she can't be in poverty because she's got an Apple Mac. But that's not how it works, that's not, it's not real. I think it's yeah. Yeah. Left university, if you don't mind saying, because of poverty issues, right? Yeah. Um, so I need to microphone. Yeah, you left 
left university because of poverty issues and, I, and I, you know we didn't explain all of that in the film um, but yes it was definitely picked up on um, with the comments afterwards yeah. are there any other questions can I, can I ask Danny a question yeah so when you're often now on on shows you get a hashtag that goes with the show and it's really interesting watching the kind of uh, stream and, and it's a really good barometer thing in how public think about issues and I was just wondering like how how much is that a part like how much do you think about what the impact that has on maybe some of the contributors like picking up on the point of Amina um, like Skip Britain was an example where like I was watching I mean it was a, a show raising awareness about the importance of uh, about the problems with universal credit but if you looked at the hashtag it was like a stream of just really negative views mm. and I just like what is the responsibility there is, is that something you think about as a channel yeah I mean it yeah it is I mean we've got um duty obviously we've got duty care issues everyone's got duty care issues but um, and that goes for the production company people who work on the production and of course the contributors so and the production company are the ones who've got the direct contact with those contributors, so talk them through, probably like you did with Amina here, and um, Amina and, and the daughter, about the, uh, what to do with your social media, with your... Um, take it off. Uh, uh, take them off, I mean, yeah, don't, don't look at them, basically. You shouldn't do, because I agree, there was, on Skin Britain, there was, partic there was a lot, actually, particularly. I mean, there was also positive stuff in there, right, that was sort of trying to punch the government as well with the universal credit, but, um, but I, I, I mean, it's a tr the truth is there is a, in the, particularly with these subject matters, they are um, inflammatory with a sort of more uh, right-wing audience. And they are, you know, they are often on social media being incredibly vitriolic and aggressive and abusive. And uh, the hard thing is we can't, we can't police Twitter. And so we can report stuff and do sometimes, mm -hmm. and Facebook and so on, but we, we, mm. we, we're not in control of them either. Mm. So the, 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 what we have to do is have a very, very honest conversation, even before filming, I think, with contributors, and then pre-TX about what you should do, the things you should watch out for, the things you should report. And I mean, my advice is just to not be on it. I mean, mm. as a contributor, when it, particularly when it's going out. I mean, you yeah. were talking about you weren't on it yourself, but people were sending you things anyway, so it's, it's kind of... Yeah, it's unavoidable hard to get away now. From, yeah, yeah we we'll live in a terrible age for that. that is yeah, for sure. I, th I think social media is such an echo chamber, and people are egging each other on. And yeah, um, but it isn't. It's not representative of the whole country by any means. It's still a small proportion of people who are actually going to bother to go on Twitter, and it's the it's just the loudest voices. Yeah. So all you can really do at the moment is just ignore it. Hard though for contributors. I think really, sometimes. really hard. Yeah. We were actually surprised with our Twitter feedback. It was just overwhelming the impact for this film, and it's you know it's not obviously got as wide-reaching range as if it had been broadcast um, on Channel Four, for example. But the Twitter was incredible, and from around the world, actually, mm. um, really just we weren't expecting it. Um, the overwhelming responses in terms mm. of positivity. So you know that was in something we actually weren't expecting, and was amazing. And Amina, how have things changed for you since making the film? Or how, how has the film changed things for you? Um, I've had a lot of positive feedback, especially to do with um, the education aid that I've been doing. A lot of people have been offering help and it's been really nice. Um, and it's strange, like, I'll just be walking in the street and someone will come up to me and be like, oh, you're Amina. And it's like... <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, it's so weird, but it's really, it's, it's nice and it's definitely impacted me in a positive way and I've been wanting to do a lot more things to do with film after and I'm a bit excited really, it's opening new doors in my mind. Great, and in, on this notion of change, as this is the subject, as you, you kind of touched on as well, what is the change that you'd like to see? Is it in the storytelling or is it in the bigger picture? Well, for us, it's definitely about the bigger picture and the change we want to see is a shift in thinking uh, that, um, you know, the way the public think about people in poverty, it shifts from 
blaming and stigmatizing people and the you know, benefit scrounger narrative versus the striver scrounger narrative. They're, they're real barriers to getting um, public support for change. And we think that without a sort of be a ground up uh, sort of demand from action from those in power, we're not going to get that. So some of these narratives, the unhelpful ones, provide cover to people in power to make changes like, you know, the benefit cap was really popular amongst the public and now we're seeing the impact of it in shows like Skip Britain. But so th we want to see a shift in the way people think about people in poverty and also the, a sense of solution that there is stuff we can do as a nation. Um, so really using like Northern Soul, Fighting Shame, having those policy discussions around it is a really important vehicle. So we're not just telling stories for storytelling's sake, we're telling them to, in, to get the change needed in our society. Yeah, definitely, definitely solutions for me. And I, for me, it's also about empathy as well, mm -hmm. and trying to get people to feel like we we have this common ground, we've got stuff in common. Um, I really, yeah, I'm really interested in empathy. Okay. Oh, I'd like to inspire a revolution. I mean, the whole <laughs> fucking thing's a mess. I mean, so I mean, the, you know, you look around. I mean, either the stories that we tell all the time in like all sorts of programs about mental health and the police, and we've got a big series about the criminal justice system. I mean, the whole thing is like, we, I feel like we're sort of banging our heads against the wall, really, as broadcasters. You're like, you do a bit, and you're like, you feel like you might be getting somewhere, you get a screening in Parliament, that sort of one politician turns up to, great. I mean, but then you have a few headlines, then we're just back to square one, like, nothing's changing. We still, policies are definitely getting worse, more people living in poverty, as you've proven. So, you know, where's the change? I mean, we're doing our bit, I think, as broadcasters and filmmakers, but... It's clearly not enough, is it? So how do you get to a point where you're inspiring much more than sort of a debate and being empathetic, which we should be doing, but how do you get even further? Um, how do you get people writing in the street? I mean, that's what we should be trying to do. I mean, I'm sort of exaggerating, obviously, but I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, I think we just have to, it needs to move on a bit further, I think. So I'll, I'll try, but um, in my time at Channel 4, but um, okay. I don't know. We look forward to seeing the revolution. Yeah, <laughs> me too. God knows what it's going to look like. <laughs> We've got time for one more question, if there is one. Amina, do you have a question? Or a comment? Well, we have the microphone. Can we, well we have the microphone at the front? Work. Thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> No, I was just going to say that um, what you was talking about working uh, with people telling the stories, trust um, is, is a big thing. We had to put trust in, 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 in you and you put trust in us and sometimes that was very frightening and, and very shaky and that, but it was nice to see the end product and we was all happy. Uh, with the end product because as well we felt that we had our input in there as well so it is trust, trust all the way around. <laughs> the other thing we've not talk, talked about actually is the, is the people making all this stuff. It's like the decision makers as you said. It's like a lot of people in power are often not from a lot of these backgrounds yeah. either mm -hmm. so we're the ones making a lot of the decisions who, I mean I'm from a slightly less conventional background as well but, but um, you know traditionally in, in you know, commissioning editors, channel controllers, executive producers, you know, that often come through quite a, an, an elite educated background mm. um, and they're not, they're not from, um, uh, from poverty. And that's also, we'd have to redress the balance on that as well. I mean, that goes for loads of stuff that we're, I think, as an industry slightly failing mm. on. So there's not enough women, there's not enough people from poverty making films, not enough people from ethnic backgrounds making for, I mean, that's, that's the truth. So we, that's another thing we have yeah. to uh -huh. work on. Yeah, I, do, yeah I mean, I, I totally agree with that. And we're the two commissioners sitting on the <laughs> panel and I don't, I, can't, I don't know anything about your background really, but clearly we're both two white men. And I do think that this is the, yeah, I mean, yeah like the people, the people holding the levers of power yeah. need to be more diverse or nothing's ever gonna change. And I think it's about also having more people in positions of power as well. It's not about replacing like, that one person at the top with someone, it's about having just like just diversifying the number of people making yeah. decisions, I think. 
And I think for me, it's, it is about the commissioning process. You know, I really just feel like now is the time that we don't commission anything else like Jeremy Kyle or Benefit Street or any, anything that, you know, where you can really, really misrepresent people and, and um, you know, use contributors as commodities and, and just not have any kind of duty of care to them so that, mm. and just absolutely misrepresent them. And I think where poverty and addiction and mental health are concerned, you know, which are very complex issues, it's so important that when we're commissioning that kind of programming, we get it spot on, actually. Yeah. I'm afraid that's all we have time for, so we've got this kind of revolutionary spirit <laughs> spirit to come in this panel. But thank you so much. Thank Congratulations you. on the film.